here we go. Um, which of the following if true? So we see that language would most strengthen. We know that we have a strengthen question here. Let's go ahead and break it down. Great, go ahead and take a moment to read this and uh, break it down. Okay, so concluded that the will to live can extend not life. Will equals more life. Will equals more life. And why is that true? Um, because of this data around seniors with close family ties are more likely to die immediately after large family gathering than immediately before. So this research study is the reason. So I want to strengthen this idea that the will to live can extend life, at least for short lengths. Let's take a look at A. Seniors with close family ties are less likely to die immediately before or during a large family gathering than at any other time of the year. It's giving me a headache to read sometimes. When that happens, I just leave an answer choice. It's A. I still have to read some more. If it's complicated, don't spend two minutes dissecting A because you may know immediately that the answer is B once you read it, but you just spent two minutes dissecting A, and that's way too long on a GMAT question for one answer choice. B. Seniors with close family ties fear dying less than seniors do. Okay, that's a strange answer choice, and the fear of death doesn't seem uh, like an issue here. Um, some seniors, again some, who have a close family ties live much longer than the majority of seniors who do not. This is giving me a headache too, so I'm going to leave this answer choice. Most seniors, lots of language here um, that, that's important. Most seniors who attend family gatherings do so for somewhat different purposes than younger attendees. Okay, I don't know if I add this as a reason, it doesn't seem to make this more valid. Um, doesn't strengthen this conclusion. How about E, the spring and fall, which have lower death rates for seniors, are the times when many families schedule large gatherings. So this is sort of saying that there's another reason. And this would be good if this was a weaken question. Because if anything, this is undermining the point here. So let's go back to A and C. A. Seniors with close family ties, which is the group that we're talking about here um, that was in the study, seniors with close family ties, are less likely to die immediately before or during a large family gathering than at any other time of the year. So this is basically them saying, well, if, if, the, if the point is that their will can extend them to live and it seems that like it's after the family gathering that they pass, Clearly it was the family gathering that was keeping them going and A points to the fact that the times when they have that will to see the family are the times when they um, when, um, they are least likely to die than at any other time. So they use these strong words are less likely, that's not as strong as any other time. This is a really strong word and it helps actually um, strengthen this point, I'm pretty sure. Let's pick it and see. Very good. Nice work. So those were some assumption, uh, uh, strengthen, and um, under uh, weakened questions that we uh, wanted to just review from last week. Um, and just to review how the course works, uh, all of our live sessions are free to watch. Um, we made the first session um, available for free to stream and, uh, and download. Um, from now on, if you want to watch sessions 2 um, through 16, um, they're available for purchase to download and watch and stream anytime, just like you did um, the first class. So let's talk about properties of integers, and let's more specifically talk about the properties of integers that the GMAT cares about. 
Um, there are a lot of terms that we're going to get down here, and it's not super um, exciting and colorful stuff, but it's important that we get all of these things. The GMAT is trying to um, tax our brain and test these sort of minutia and little corner cases of math rules to make sure that we're paying attention and to give our brain more to keep in line. So some, some ways that they can mess with us, and we see the GMAT mess with us with language all the time, we need to make sure that in the heat of the test, we are able to make sense of all these words, even though some of them may seem basic and straightforward. Um, I, we really got we to gotta check this against ourselves. If there's one point here that we make over the next couple of slides that wasn't on the back of your hand, then this was worth it because there will be a question like that probably on your GMAT and now you'll get it. So the GMAT likes slinging around words like integer, very fancy word for a number, right? Integers, divisor or factor, which are pretty much the same thing, um, quotient and remainder as well, related terms and we're going to see um, how they're related, like divisor and factor are related. So an integer is any number in this set, and it goes in either direction forever. This is the definition of, a, of, uh, of how we relate divisors and factors. So here we go. If y equals xn for some integer n, then x is a divisor or factor of y, and y is divisible by x or a multiple of x. And if that sounds complicated, the reason I express it this way is because this rule is a very specific rule that defines these terms, and this is how the GMAT likes to use these terms interchangeably with the math that you see here. Um, so divisor and factor and this math all connect to each other through this definition. So if y equals xn for some integer n, then x, we have here, x is the divisor or factor, and y is a multiple. And we'll break that down a little bit more in a moment as well. For quotients and remainders, here's the definition, even longer. For positive integers x and y, so positive integers x and y, there exist unique integers. Unique means not the same as each other. So this rule is getting more and more complicated. The quotient q and the remainder r such that y equals xq plus r. So remember, the rule is for positive integers x and y. So these are positive integers. There exists a unique integers. There exists unique integers, the quotient and the remainder. So q and r can't be the same as each other, um, such that r is less than x and greater than 0. So we'll see examples of these words as we go through the course. Um, <clears throat> but remember that you may remember these words, quotient and remainder from third grade, but the actual definition for them is relatively complicated. And if the GMAT wants to test some nuance of this definition, like whether or not the remainder and the quotient are unique, or whether or not x and y are positive integers versus negative integers, um, we don't want to get tripped up on that. So let's talk a little bit more. So even integers, odd integers, prime numbers. Let's think of some examples of these. This should be pretty straightforward. So even integers, negative 2, um, negative 4, 2. Everyone, go ahead. Type in some even integers, um, some odd integers. What are some odd integers? Negative 1 is odd, 1 is odd, 3 is odd. Very good. How about some prime numbers? I think 11 should be a prime number. 3 is a prime number. Um, what else is a prime number? 5 is a prime number. There's lots of prime numbers. What is the definition of a prime number? It's important. Even integers. The definition of an even integer is any integer that is divisible by 2. Odd integer is any integer that is not divisible by 2. And a prime number, this is another, GMAT loves prime number questions because the definition of a prime number is comp, has lots of pieces to it. So if you mess up on one of those pieces, the GMAT will get you. So these are all the pieces. A prime number has to be positive. It has to be an integer. It has to have two distinct positive divisors, one and itself. 
one is not a prime number. And the rule, the reason one is not, it's not part of the rule, the reason one is not a prime number is that one is not distinct from itself. It's the same as itself. So it does not meet that one criteria of what a prime number should be, is that it is distinct um, in a one and another number. So the GMAT loves these terms. They use these terms in the questions. You should know what they mean, and you should be able to react quickly to dealing with them. So consecutive integers. Everyone go ahead and give me some consecutive integers. Um, give me some consecutive even integers. And give me some consecutive odd integers. Again, each adjective that the GMAT ad adds on to a, uh, onto a word the more complicated the math gets, the more difficult it gets to do it very quickly and accurately. Um, it's, people are going to get con questions about consecutive even integers um, wrong more often than they're going to get questions about just consecutive integers um, because there's just one more term that you got to keep track. You have to keep track of, and they'll trip some people up. Um, and this is all important in the consideration of what types of questions to be using. So let's take a look at some examples of these consecutive integers. So uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3. These are some uh, consecutive integers. Consecutive even integers and consecutive odd integers can be expressed a couple of ways as numbers, right? So consecutive even integers could be 2, 4, 6, Eight, but it could also be expressed like this as equations, right? n, n plus 2, n plus 4. Um, and the same thing with odd integers. We could have 3, 5, 7, 9. Um, but we could also see the GMAT um, use the term consecutive odd integers. Um, but they can use this term interchangeably with this math. So if I see this, all the GMAT is talking about is consecutive odd integers. I don't need to get intimidated when I see this. It's just talking about consecutive odd integers. So now that I've seen this, I can add that to my GMAT robot programming and anticipate it if, if it happens later. Um, more terms. Divisor and factor. We talked about these. If y equals xn for some integer n, whoops, uh, then x is the divisor of uh, or factor of y, and y is divisible or a multiple of x. So let's take a look at how I personally remember factors and multiples. So here's some number 12. Okay. So what are the multiples of 12? Everyone type in some multiples of 12, and everyone type in some factors of 12. Make sure to type in which one is which when you're typing in the numbers. What are some factors of 12, and what are some multiples of 12? So this is a mnemonic, and this is another sort of edge case of multiples and factors that the GMAT loves to, qu to uh, quiz you on, um, and we'll see here in a moment. So multiples of 12 are, for example, uh, 24, 36. Factors of 12 are numbers like 3, um, 4. So the edge case that's a little bit the GMAT likes to go after is 12 itself. So is 12 a factor of 12? Is 12 a multiple of 12? Let's get some answers there. Is 12 a factor of 12? Is 12 a multiple of 12? While people are answering that, I'll tell you how I use a little mnemonic here to remember factors and multiples. Well, factors are fewer. It's not really the right number. The, number the, the word should be less, but mnemonically it works for me. So the numbers are smaller than the, num the number that we're talking about. Whereas multiples, this one works a little better, multiples are more, like 24 and 36. So M more, F fewer, and the answer is yes. 12 is a multiple of 12, and 12 is a factor of 12. It's the smallest multiple, 
It's the least multiple, uh, least largest multiple, and the largest factor of 12 is 12. And so this edge case on div divisors and factors and multiples, the GMAT likes to get us on.